Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Visibility Era, the podcast. Today, I'm here with Liv. Liv, what's going on in your world? How are you today? Hi. Well, thank you so much for having me. Uh, Everything is good in my realm today. It is a beautiful day here in sunny Chicago, and the leaves are changing, changes in the air. It's the holiday gifting season. Uh, But yeah, everything is good. So fun. I'm excited to talk to you today. You know, we actually have not had anyone on the podcast that does affiliate PR or exactly what you do. So like you're going to be like a whole new world to our audience, especially. So we'll probably have to give them backstory on like what this is and all of that. Um, But where we usually love to start with our guests is how the heck did you get into this work? Did you study in college? You know, you and I already kind of chatted, but I'd love for you to share a little bit of the, the quick backstory with our people. Totally. So the way that I got into PR is very unconventional. And I always joke, it's like very Gen Z. So during the pandemic, I was at the time working at a prosthetic and orthotic clinic here in Chicago, which was the place I never thought I would be working. Uh, I got the job by temping and then that became a full-time role. Obviously everyone became remote. So I was at home and I think like everyone, I got addicted to TikTok. And at first it was kind of a joke. And then it was like, oh, this is so silly. And then all of a sudden you're addicted to it. And it really kind of reignited my love for kind of like the Vine days. And I had never created any content before. And so when TikTok came around, I was like, well, I'm in my house and I am not perceiving any other people besides my partner who I'm living with. So I started making videos and they started to actually get some traction and people were interacting with them. I ended up making some online friends, which was really fun, especially during the pandemic where, you know, you're not able to leave your house and ended up making friends with a musician who was based in LA. And she uh, asked for my help with some uh, artist bio work and a press release. She knew that I had an English background. um, So I had got an English degree from um, the school I went to in upstate New York. And she was like, wait, actually, you're really good at this. Do you want to help me with some press things for a new song that I'm coming out with? And I was like, yeah, totally. So I was working my 40 hour a week job uh, Monday through Thursday. And then on Fridays, I would just spend the entire day doing PR. And at that time, I also didn't know what I was doing was PR. So I was Googling it. I was like, this feels really good. And I really like what I'm doing. And I just think that this is all of my interests and my skills all coming into one job. So I'm just going to Google like what exactly am I doing? What is this is a job? It feels like a job. And the Google search was like, yeah, this is a publicist. That's what you are. I was like, oh, okay, cool. There's a, there's a word, there's a job, there's a description. And I eventually quit my full-time job and started my own PR agency. So at that time I was working specifically with musicians and eventually transitioned into the world of CPG and, uh, working with brands. So cool. You know, what's really funny. You probably don't know this about like Lydia and my backstory, but I am a, I've been a yoga teacher since 2016, holistic health coach. And basically I was just doing like anything I could at the time to get myself out there. I was getting myself speaking opportunities. I was getting myself onto podcasts. I was getting myself in the media and I was just like doing it. I did not know what this was either. So it's so funny that you said like, I like this, but I actually have no idea what this is. Goes to Google, Dr. Google, and we type in like what we're doing. And it's like, oh, this is PR. This is public relations. Like this is a thing. So I love that. I love that. And this is how Lydia and I came together. I've just been doing this for myself for years without knowing this was a thing. And she's been doing it for brands for a really long time. So I love this for you. So you kind of just like put all of your talents, your gifts, your abilities together. You realize, hey, I could do this for others. So tell us a little bit about like Mystic PR, because I think our audience is a little bit more familiar with what, you know, Lydia's agency would do very much like founder facing um, press. Tell us like what you do. I want to go into that. Yeah. So working with brands um, in the lifestyle space, beauty space, uh, food and beverage, there's a pet client we're working with now Mm -hmm. um, and we're get them set up on an affiliate platform. So if you're not familiar with what an affiliate platform is, maybe you've heard of share sale, maybe you've heard of impact. So basically we kind of have to go back in time for this back in the good old days of publications, they were making their money off of ads uh, for print. And with the digital age taking over and digital press taking over, they had to find a new way to capitalize on revenue. So the best way I like to describe it is BuzzFeed roundups and listicles, 10 best dog beds. You go in, you'll see all the different dog beds they've tried, they've included. And every time you click on 
a specific product, the publisher will get a certain percentage of commission off of that sale. So it's kind of a win-win for everyone. The brand gets featured. They're also able to make sales and drive traffic to their websites. And the publications are able to capitalize off of those sales too. They're also able to say, hey, are you know these brands resonating with our audience? Are we going to be looking to include them again? Um, and so really it's just a win-win for everyone. So we get them set up on an affiliate platform. We work with um, Impact. That is the publisher preferred um, affiliate platform for anyone who is looking at different affiliate options. I always recommend Impact. Um, and then we manage the program. So approving, denying affiliates, making sure there's nothing wonky going on there and also doing traditional media. So pitching out brands, sharing to journalists or sharing to editors, coordinating sampling, um, and basically just bridging the gap between traditional PR and this new affiliate uh, realm that has taken over the affiliate uh, the PR space. It's so interesting because I also don't think consumers have any idea how this works. Like, you know, if they're just like reading the BuzzFeed article or the listicle, I haven't heard that term in so long, but like, gosh, <laughs> I remember it. Um, if they're just like reading it, they don't realize what's going on behind the scene with the brand, with the actual like publication. They have no idea. So like, this is really cool, I think, for consumers to kind of see and pull back the curtain of how this works. But I do want to talk about it like even more for brands. So really, this is just for products, product companies, would you say? Or would this ever be, would a like small business owner who is a chiropractor, would they ever have a reason to be on a site like that? So definitely it's more product facing um, with having like an e-commerce um, CPG based focus. I think that affiliate is definitely going to be expanding into the more service-based um, industry as things kind of progress. Um, for example, if there's like a class that you can sign up for, like a masterclass kind of situation and referring people to masterclass, and maybe you have a unique code that you can get people to sign up for. Um, so I kind of like to use masterclass as an example. It's super well known. Um, but I think that as the affiliate world kind of gets more built out, I think that we can definitely see the application with service-based uh, products. Ooh, really interesting. Yeah, I never thought about it like with that application, but I could definitely see that. And it really is a win-win because the whole thing that we usually talk about with you know, press and media is that you are leveraging someone else's platform who's usually bigger than yours. So a lot of these like big publications that the small business or the brand would like to be affiliated with, like they have the audience. So it's it's definitely a win-win for that platform to win potentially through like making some money off of sharing you. But you as the small business owner who wouldn't likely get that type of reach, like just on social media, that's such a win. Like, how do you kind of describe this to your clients? Do they get it right away? Or do you need to kind of explain what does that look like for you? There's definitely a learning curve, which I always tell my clients that it's not a super easy concept to just pick up. Um, and even in the affiliate space, things are changing rapidly. So there's always new things to learn. Um, and I think the best way to kind of describe it is that editors and journalists are the OG influencers. They are the, the they were the first ones that, you know, were receiving product, testing it out. And obviously if there's a paid aspect uh, for a publication that will kind of sweeten the pot for them to include it. Um, but the organic editorial consideration is just the best way to go versus like an influencer where there's like, you know, the fees that are coming in and then you don't have that really clear ROI. Um, but yeah, I, I always just think of editors as just original influencers um, and want to give them the flowers they deserve. The OGs. I'm like trying to like write that, write that time down so we can um, pull that. That was really cool. Um, <laughs> I like that statement. So when people come to you and when brands come to you, do you, have they already worked with influencers? Like, is that the path that they've usually done prior or like, what is their understanding of that world? Or maybe they don't know anything about it yet. So definitely it's case by case. And we've had some brands come in that have done just some light influencer work, just some gifting. Um, that's kind of, if you're going to go down the influencer way and you're a small brand, that's kind of the best way to go. Um, obviously there's no requirement for posting and sharing, just kind of having a more organic inclusion and sharing opportunity, especially, you know, if you're searching within the influencer space and seeing 
who's really aligned with the brand. I think the influencer space has changed a lot since it started and creators are now offering, you know, they're being a little bit more strict with their requirements for working with a brand. They're saying, okay, I only want to do paid opportunities, which I understand. Um, but obviously with a small brand, the gifting is a little bit more appealing when it comes to finances. Um, I know that there are, you know, some micro influencer agencies that are out there to work with kind of small creators. Um, and I think that it's really interesting to see the trust level that's going on with influencers. There's a lot of perspectives saying that influencer culture is dying. It's become a lot less trustworthy with creators. You're, there's been a lot of examples of creators getting caught, um, you know, promoting a product that's not necessarily the most honest way that there it's a pay to play situation. And the relatability with influencers is just kind of going away. All of these creators that were maybe in a small town in the Midwest or in upstate New York are moving out to LA and are just plugging all of these products because they're, that's how they're making their living. They're getting all of these paid opportunities. Um, I think that there's still ways to work with influencers. I think you just have to be a lot more conscientious with it. And I think that working with influencers on a gifting campaign, in addition to having an affiliate platform up, can be really beneficial because you can see exactly which creators are performing and make those adjustments in real time. Yeah, I like the analytics part. And I want to like touch on what you just said around trust. I, my husband and I are like big YouTube TV watchers. We don't really like, I don't have cable. We don't really have Hulu or like many other things. Same. So we watch a lot of YouTube <laughs> and we watch a lot of like YouTube kind of travel, people who go all over the world, right? We love that kind of stuff. And we watched this one channel and the guy was, it was an obvious ad, right? So he like travels and he was like, it was some kind of ad for like a tech thing. Maybe it was like a 360 kind of GoPro, whatever the, the technology was. And I was so surprised at the hate he was getting in the comments. I was like, damn guys, how do you think that this guy is able to move this channel forward? Like it is through ads and his brand deals and like those types of sponsorships. So yeah, it's interesting what you say about trust. Like, why do you think things are changing so much with that because it was very obvious from these comments that they didn't feel like they trusted this person anymore because he was selling them something. I think it's really interesting to see the trust, especially in the wellness market, promoting these supplements. And I think AG1. that's especially... <laughs> <laughs> I, I really feel like all of the content I've seen that it's like an ad and it's a sponsorship or all of these like supplements and um, gummies and everything like that. And the wellness industry, I, I could, you know, go on a whole tangent about wellness. Um, but it's just really interesting to see these products being promoted. And when you actually are doing the research into them, like, are there any, you know, studies that are backing this up, but there's scientific data, um, and I know that there's obviously influencers that are very conscientious with who they're working with because they've built an audience. That's something that's very, you know, hard to do. And that's why they're getting these opportunities and they don't want to compromise that. And also not promoting a product that could be, you know, dangerous to their audience and also not aligned with their own brand. Um, I think it, you see this a lot in the beauty industry too, of not wanting to, send a certain message to an influencer's audience of you need this product to achieve, you know, this specific beauty look, or you need to have this to feel confident. Um, I think it's just people are being trying to be a little bit more transparent of, Hey, this is an ad like this, I'm, you know, earning money from this. And, um, it's, it's really fascinating to see the arc of, content creators starting out to now where we are today, because it's really just something that's happened in the past 10 years. And, you, you know, you have people like James Charles, who's a creator who is from upstate New York and now lives in this massive LA mansion um, and is, you know, no stranger to controversy. So uh, I think it's just really interesting to see how important trust is between an audience and a creator and how, different creators maintain that trust or, you know, brand deals can completely erode that trust. Yeah. And I feel like this is where like going back to your work, it's people already have a little bit more of the trust with a lot of these publications. I mean, there's like 
obviously people have lots of opinions about that too but I think in some ways because it's not a person necessarily talking about the product it's like a listicle or here's like a top gifts for moms this holiday season like you don't have some of that personal connection but it actually benefits the company and I think the consumer in that space so do you also notice that like people are more trustworthy I guess of people reading the publications and then having those brands in the publications versus just like the brand and influencer deals since people are like not trusting those a hundred percent with organic inclusion it's just a lot more built on trust and alignment within the piece um I know for myself personally if I'm looking for something I always go to wire cutters roundups like when we got our dog we were looking for an air purifier and we immediately went to wire cutter to see their list of their best, uh, air purifiers. And the number one, uh, air purifier we found the editor wrote, I like, I've never been emotional about an appliance before, but this one brought me to tears, like get it. And so I was telling my partner, I'm like, we got to get this now. Like this made this wire cutter editor emotional. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Really interesting that you say that. Um, okay. Some nitty gritty stuff here. So Let's say that someone's listening has a product, maybe we'll say like some sort of beauty product, and they are like new to all of this. They, you know, they have a social media following, they have a website, maybe they did like a soft launch, but they've never done any kind of like affiliate or any like press in general. What do they need to know, especially about like sampling? Because I'm hearing that that's a big part of like what you're doing and coordinating. Like, what does that mean for the founder? What does that mean for the brand? What do they need to have kind of prepped before that can move forward with you? So whenever I meet with a prospective client, I always want to get a sense of where they are with their website, their inventory, and their high-res imagery. Those are kind of the big three of having a successful PR campaign. So if you have a strong website, you have a great web design, um, the user interface is great, you have a strong e-commerce platform, awesome. Um Shopify, just for anyone who's listening, if you want to go down the affiliate route, Shopify is the preferred platform uh, for impact, but totally no worries if you don't have Shopify, but if you do, it's a plus. Um, when it comes to imagery, always want to make sure that there are really high quality uh, photos to share with editors. They want to include it, obviously. Um, and then also the inventory. So totally depends on the price point for the specific product. I've had brands that have products that are, you know, 15 to $20 and all the way up to 300, um, 350. So we can be a little more conscientious with those higher priced items, um, and making sure that we're being really strategic and where we're sending out product. Um, but I always check in with my brands and whenever a product request comes in, always letting them know, Hey, so-and-so requests, you know, this product, checking in with the inventory, especially before the holidays. Um, this is kind of around the time of year that people are restocking. So wanting to make sure that we have it in stock. And if we don't, just telling the editor, hey, like this is currently getting restocked right now, but we can totally send you this other piece. Um, or if you'd like to wait, that's also great. Um, but I always make sure that brands are comfortable with sending products to editors. Yeah. I mean, I love Costco for a reason. You got to get those samples, right? <laughs> like that's always the best. Uh, yeah. I think this is good for brands to know because if they're new to this space, they might not even be thinking about these things or like making sure that they have something in their inventory. Talk a little bit about like timeline because I know a lot of, you know, products want to be in product roundups. So when do they need to be thinking about, you know, contacting the media or contacting an agency like yours to be able for those things to go live? Like what is the timeline? Line look like? Totally. So it definitely depends on the time of year and what the specific goals are. So let's take the holiday season, for example. So we really start pitching media in around August um, at the latest September, which I know if anyone listening, it might sound insane. Um, I was actually talking to an editor at Magnolia Journal back in February. So right after the holiday season and uh, this editor was like, oh yeah, like we'd love to sample for consideration. We maybe have like a photo shoot in July for our holiday gift guide. Granted, this was print. So there's obviously a longer lead time with print, yeah. um, but digital, we're always thinking at least two to three months ahead for the holiday season. Um, starting at around September, I would say is probably a safe bet. Uh, I always like to go in August just to, look, to get, make sure that's getting in the editor's inbox. And, you know, even if they're not, 
searching that right now, they can still search it and find it in their inbox for later if they have a roundup that could be included. Um, for Black Friday, Cyber Monday sharing for any deals that might be going on, I would say sharing that out as soon as you have the details nailed down, which generally speaking comes to brands timeline is around September. Uh, that's kind of like when they get everything finalized, but sharing that out and then every following pitch I'm sharing out for those brands, I'm always including their Black Friday, Cyber Monday deals just to make sure in case that, you know, it got lost in the shuffle, um, always wanting to make sure we're calling out the Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So smart. Yeah. There's a lot of people need to be thinking about this. This is not just like, you're not doing this in November guys. Like this is, <laughs> this has been thought through and that's why like a campaign that's to think of it like a campaign, like that's, that's really what the mindset we need to think of here. I'd love to get your take on press releases. Like Lydia and I, because we have mostly focused on like founder facing PR, like brand PR versus product, we usually recommend, you know, a mixture of cold outreach, like inbound inquiries using platforms like Quoted or Harrow or not Harrow anymore, SOS, you know, some of these platforms. But we we don't always talk about press releases depending on the company. So I'd love to hear like for most product brands, do you still feel like the good old press release still has a kind of a fit in the strategy? I think it depends on the specific kind of coverage that you're looking for. Um, I think that can be definitely beneficial if there's a really strong founder story there and um, especially for time of year. So let's say it's uh, Women's History Month. I think that that can be really strong with female founded brands. Um, if there's any sort of story that's going on with the brand and kind of the genesis of how it was founded, does the founder have like some adversity that they overcame to achieve, you know, X, Y, or Z and starting their company. I think that they could still be beneficial, um, especially for very, very specific um, kind of press opportunities. Yeah. And like what I like to remind people is that it's then on the internet. And usually these are getting syndicated through a lot of different and distributed through a lot of different platforms. So I know I used to run a publishing company. And one of the things that I would always do when a book came out is I would, you know, submit a press release to The Wire or whatever, you know, site I was using. And if I type in my name, it still comes up. So I do think just from like an SEO searchability um, perspective for a brand, I still think it's very valid. I do think business owners need to understand the purpose of a press release and that it's like it's very informational. You know, you are letting the the public or potential writers, journalists, editors know about something that has happened or in your like what you said, a little bit of like an example of the founder story or a little bit of the background. So I think that's what's important. But a lot of people think that PR is doing a press release. <laughs> Have you gotten that? Yes. I've also had people just completely uh, not understand at all what I do. Like I've, I've asked people like, what do you think I do? What do you think PR is? And I just think they have just a big question mark over their head of like, I, I don't know. Like you, I know you use a laptop and I've seen you type, <laughs> but I don't know what you're typing. So <laughs> it is, um, you know, Lydia and I find that there's a big education piece to it. And I'm sure like that's why when 100%. you get on those calls, like with your prospective clients, you are educating, you're asking questions, you're really seeing where they're at because we were on a call the other day and it was like they were putting PR and marketing together as one, which they're absolutely cousins. Like we like to say that they're absolutely related. You know, they all have like a very simple, similar purpose and but a different way of getting there and getting to that exact goal. So I hear you, girl. I hear you. Absolutely. I think it's also a lot of sales goals get put on marketing and yes. especially PR. And so yes. if anyone is listening, PR is not sales. Marketing is not sales. We can help with sales for sure. And at the end of the day, PR is about getting your product and your brand in front of the right people, getting it in the right hands. Totally. It is up to the editor and the publication, obviously, if that's going to translate into a story. Um, and I think it's also tricky with affiliate where you can see all these clicks, you can see like the conversion rate. So you can see, oh, like, okay, this, this article drove a lot of clicks. We didn't see a lot of conversion. Um, maybe that means bringing on a partner that could help with conversion on the website um, or, you know, obviously switching up the publications that we're looking for and where the audience is really going to resonate. Um, so anyone is a PR person out there? I know it can be hard not to put sales goals on yourself um, and it's hard not to take that on, but PR, marketing, 
not sales. We can help with sales, but at the end of the day, brand visibility, brand recognition, and getting your product and brand into the hands of the right people. 1000% preach. And I think like on the bigger scale, all of those things together can support sales initiatives because you are like potentially driving new traffic and new eyes to your site, which wouldn't naturally be there if it wasn't for what happened. But yeah, I think this is where like brands need to like see. We always like to say it's a 360 approach to business growth in general because you have these all you have all these separate functions they're all supporting each other they're all working in tandem but we can't say that like you're not going to say I'm going to get you sixty thousand dollars from doing this so has that been hard for you to ever like explain to potential clients like do they understand it what are you finding in those conversations I think that The biggest thing I like to communicate to prospective clients or current clients is just there are no guarantees in media. Um, And if anyone is saying, I can guarantee you X amount of placements in Forbes, they're either paying for that or they are not telling the truth because (laughs) there's just no guarantee. Even if, you know, you have the best relationships with all these editors, your, you know, brother could be the founder of, you know, X, Y, or Z doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be, you're going to be able to get that brand or that client to that publication. Um, so I always like to be transparent, be upfront and say, you know, this maybe doesn't make sense at this time. And that's okay. Like at the end of the day, I want you to make the best decision for your business because that helps me help you. Um, and if it's not a good fit at this time, that's okay. But there are no guarantees in media there have been multiple times where stories have been written, made, ready to publish. And I've been talking to the editors and they're saying, yeah, I submitted it and I don't know why it's not live. There was a piece that was supposed to go live for Mother's Day and now it's October. And the editor's like, I don't know, the the publication, I guess, just didn't publish it. Or a freelancer who's like, oh, I really, really loved it. It was great. I have a whole feature article I want to write or I want to include this in this roundup. And then they're like, hey, my editor actually cut the story, which it's not great. And it, it it's like a gut punch, but it's also you can just control what you can control. Yeah. And I think this like brings it back full circle of this conversation around trust and transparency because we feel the same way. It's like we tell people very flat in the face, this is a long-term strategy. Like this is not something where you're likely going to see something happen tomorrow, but it's the compound effect. So if you see, if that's your mentality going into business in general, you will get what we're doing here. Like you will understand this on a deeper level. And I think that like in the time of social media and like creator culture where it's like get 10K in 10 minutes, <laughs> um, people have start started to lose that trust with that type of messaging because they're like, no, that's that's not real. And if you think about business in general, like there's no guarantees in business either. Like it is a risk. That's what all of us entrepreneurs have taken. We've taken a risk. A hundred percent. I think that the fast, easy hacks that you see all over TikTok um, are just one, getting debunked. um, And also people are just like, okay, well, you know, it's just like business. There's no shortcuts to it. There's obviously advantages that people can have. And I totally understand business owners being wary of investments, especially when you're a small business and you're trying to grow. Um, totally understand. So always want to be upfront with that and make sure that we're also on the same page when it comes to expectations. I think managing expectations too um, in press and media is a really, really big, important part of working with clients and making sure, you know, like you're showing, okay, you know, we've gotten product in the hands of X, Y, and Z. um, And, you know, we're doing everything you can or following up with editors. um, And then you can obviously see the great thing about affiliate is let's say that you had a story that was published before you were on an affiliate network. They see that you're a part of it now and they could go and retroactively add an affiliate link. You can see that piece perform until the end of time, until that piece, uh, you know, let's say they take it off the internet for some reason, which they would not do. Uh, but you can see the sales come through and see, okay, like people are still interacting with this as they're optimizing it. They're using SEO. Um, so I always just love, uh, being able to communicate to clients about 
the lovely world of media. <laughs> Amazing. And it lives on the internet forever. You're right. Like likely they're not taking that down and there's going to be those holiday gift guides. A lot of times they just update them. Like a hundred percent, especially with, you know, media layoffs. They're like, okay, like what, how can we get the most bang for our <laughs> buck? Let's just optimize this article and call it a day. So cool. Um, I think we could chat for a long time. I guess here's like two of my last questions. If someone's listening to this today, when and they're a small business owner or product, when should they call you? When should they be like, Liv, I need you yesterday? When do they call you? <laughs> you call me when you have a strong website, you have high res imagery, um, you have the inventory to send out to uh, media. Uh, and you are ready to go on an affiliate network. Um, it's, I will say the impact investment is definitely on the more affordable side. Um, it's more competitive for share of sale. So, um, it's about $30 a month, um, for impact. So not a huge investment there. Um, and you also understand that PR is a long game and you're in it for the long game. I love that. So, so cool. Um, what else do you have on your radar coming up? Anything like, exciting that you can share with our audience? Uh, let's see. What do we have coming up? Uh, we have a lot of exciting um, clients that we're working with right now. And I am very, very excited to see um, all of the holiday gift guides that are going to be upcoming. Um, I don't want to give anything away yet, but we have some exciting things coming down the pipeline um, and just working with some really amazing clients um, that I truly feel so grateful for. I think that's one of the highlights of being an entrepreneur and a business owner is getting to work with really cool people and really cool brands um, and just also just really, really amazing human beings. Um, so that's all will be revealed soon. <laughs> that was so fun. Well, everyone needs to go over to Liv's website. What is it? Tell us exactly what it is. <laughs> it's mysticpr.com. Okay. It is the sexiest like website ever, everyone. <laughs> so we'll put it in the show notes, but I need everyone to just stop what you're doing. Go over to mysticpr.com and just take a look at what she's got going on because it's, yeah, really, really incredible. And this has been such a fun conversation, Liv. I'm so glad that you could join me here today. For another episode of Visibility Era. Yeah, thanks, Liv. Have a great day. Thank you.